I appreciate Matt's prayer this morning. I was reminded of Romans 15, 7, where it says, Wherefore, accept one another, just as Christ accepted us to the glory of God. Uh, and, and, and that is exactly a, a most needful thing uh, in this world today. Uh, there's just a lot of anger out there. You know, and so I think it's good for us to be able to focus on a lesson that is uh, all about ministry. Um, ministry from the perspective, though, if you want to be turning your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is where we're going to be spending our time today. A lot of other passages we'll take a peek at as we discuss what is uh, in here. Um, <clears throat> but... Uh, we want to try to answer a few questions. What is ministry as it relates to the things that we teach or that we're supposed to teach? Who does it affect? Um, what is its effect? Uh, you know, and so the, I think these are really good questions. What is our ministry, my, each of us, what is our ministry here as it relates to these things, the various missions within. You know, <clears throat> there is, uh, there, there's basically five things that we're going to talk about here from 2 Corinthians 3. Uh, first of all, our mission within this ministry is, is personal, Okay. Our, another mission within this ministry is that we need to keep in mind it's spiritual. All right, that's very important too. This ministry is glorious. Uh, and, and that's kind of a neat thing to see as well. This ministry also is hope-filled. Uh, we ever need to keep before us that there is always hope, you know, um, and where our son is right now, uh, it is a huge thing that they try to do with the patients there is to keep ever before them. There is always hope, you know, always hope. And then uh, lastly, when we fully understand what this mission is, it truly is liberating uh, as well. So we're going to look at those things uh, too. So in the, anyway, the first four verses here that we look at, <clears throat> let's read these from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It says, Are we beginning to con, uh, commend ourselves again, or do we need as some letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter written in our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts, and such confidence we have through Christ toward God. You know, what's part of what is taking place here is that continued attack against Paul. And as we had mentioned at the outset of this particular series, a lot of the things that Paul is doing here is defending his ministry. And so there uh, he, he posed a question, do we have to commend ourselves? Uh, do we need letters of commendation uh, from you? Do we need to bring uh, letters of commendation uh, to you? And so, and so it implies you know, that there may be a lack of trust that's going on here. We as... Let me, let me pose this question from your perspective, sitting out there. We each have a right to expect high standards from those that lead us. We do. Uh, when you look at the letters of Timothy and Titus, there are the standards that are put forth for elders, overseers, bishops, pastors. Uh, those are listed there, shepherds, deacons, you know, and so we expect those kinds of things. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Test the spirits to see whether they be of God. There are a lot of people in the world who are teaching religious things. There's a lot of people in the world that are putting forth uh, whatever ideas there are that, that can be there. Uh, uh, those ideas from the person teaching them uh, that are designed to lead them to God. Okay? to bring them to heaven. But the fact of the matter still stands. There is a right way 
that gets us to heaven, and there are a lot of wrong ways that say they get a person to heaven, but in fact, they do not. Uh, in, in 1 John chapter uh, 1, the first four verses there, these are basically the qualifications that were put forth for the uh, apostles. And it says there, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what our hands handled uh, concerning the word of life, and the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. What John is saying here regarding the ministry of the apostles and the standard that they are to hold to, they were taught things by Christ, by the Spirit of God, and those things that they were taught, they were not to alter, they were to teach to others, why were the others taught those things? It is, according to this passage, so that they too, the hearers of the apostolic teachings, would lead people to heaven. That's what they were to teach. They're not to teach anything else. Anybody teaching any class, speaking of which, uh, uh, we, we might begin praying about when we can start our Bible classes again. We stopped doing them, you know, uh, earlier part of the year, and, and, and it might be good for us. And, that's, and I do apologize for being late today. You know, I looked at the clock, and Annie said, hey, it's time for us to go. And I said, there's no, we're not doing class yet, you know, and so we don't have to leave for a little bit. Then, you know, it's, we got to go now. You know, I roll in here at two minutes after 10. I, I do apologize. That is, that is irresponsible um, of me. So, uh, anyway, uh, there are standards. We need to take pride in the things that we teach others. And I'm not saying it's, it's not pride on our part. It's... We're going to be talking about glory here in, in, in a little bit. And it is a glorious thing to be able to teach something to somebody. And, and you read a passage and, and, you, and you watch the expression on their face. I was visiting with a lady last week and uh, you know she's giving me her spiritual history and I shared with her a passage and you, you could see her eyes glaze. And it's like, wow, you know? And... And, and it's, it's an awesome thing when people come to realize a truth that they had not been told before. You know, it's, it's great. I used to, I was a cabinet maker for a spell, and, and I really enjoyed making uh, cabinets. I've got, there are three pieces in our house that have been there for years. We use them uh, constantly. Uh, but there is one piece that sits in my shed. I, I like it a lot. It had a great function, but I don't use it. And, and, and the reasons are is because I use the wrong material for one thing. It is, it is, there is no plywood anywhere on this. It is 100% hardwood. This thing is heavy. It is heavy. Not only that, because I used hardwood... Uh, on some of the pieces, uh, the drawer faces have bent. The drawers on this are un unusable because of what happened to the wood there. And, and so, but the other pieces that are, that are in my house, you know, if someone says, hey, that's pretty pretty neat TV cabinet, you know, and, and, and I don't, I'm not shy in telling them, you know, I, I built that. Uh, and it's a centerpiece. It is finished on all four sides. You could, you could turn it around. It'll look good in back. It'll look good in front. I like that. It's neat. Um, but this is the kind of idea that, that we should have when we're going forth in, in our ministry to share the Word with somebody. We're not building something to set a TV on or pile books in. We are building something in the lives of, of somebody else that is going to be absolutely 
more functional because they're going to be better persons for themselves. They're going to be better persons for others. They are going to be better persons for God. And as a result of that, heaven is achieved for them. All because of the ministries that we are involved in. Uh, we bless others. That's what Paul is saying when he says, you are our letter. If anybody needs a letter of commendation regarding the ministry that we are involved in, he's pointing to the people themselves and the changes that have taken place in their life. Why? Solely as a result of the things that they taught. It's, it, this is truly uh, uh, an awesome thing. There's a special link that is created when we look at the lives of those that are taught, when we look at the lives of those that we minister to, that are ministered to, that become ministers. In, in uh, Philemon, the first couple of verses there, I want to read this to share with you this, this idea. Paul says here, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother to Philemon, our beloved brother and fellow worker. You see, look at the terms that he's using here. He's, he's talking about that tie that exists as a result of his ministry, his teaching ministry. And to Athi, our sister, and to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. These are just... These are, these are endearing terms. These are neat things. Notice what he says here. And, and if you're not familiar, if you're just to kind of remind you of what's going on in this particular letter, letter there was a fellow that had been ministering to Paul. Apparently, he was a runaway slave. And, and uh, in, in the time that he had run away from Philemon, Onesiphus is who we're talking about here. He had met up with Paul. Paul led him to Christ, okay? And Paul is sending this letter back to Philemon by the hands of Onesiphus. So this man has to go and confront his owner because he is a slave. And he's going back there. He does, he's not sure what he's, going to, what he's going to deal with, what he's going to face. You know, but Paul says here, in, in uh, continuing here down uh, in verses 8, uh, verses 10 and 11, he says here, I appeal to you for my child whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. Onesipus, uh, Onesimus, who was formerly useless to you, but now is useful both to you and to me. And look at verse 12. I have sent him back to you in person. That is sending my very heart. These are the ties. These are expressions of the ties that are created between us and those we serve, between us and those to whom we we minister here. And, and, and it's, it's important that we understand the context that Paul is talking about here regarding this ministry uh, uh, is expressed, I think, very well in John chapter 1, verse 17, where it says, Moses gave you the law, but grace and truth are realized through Jesus Christ. So Moses taught one thing, it's not, it's, it isn't bad, not, accor not according to what Paul teaches to the Galatians. You know, the, the, the Old Testament served its purpose, right? But, but, he says, there is a better ministry, one that is realized in Jesus Christ. And that's what he is wanting us to understand, wanting them to understand. And so, in verses 5 through 8 of 2 Corinthians 3, we find here a... Uh, the fact that the ministry we're in, we are involved in is truly spiritual. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. I, I can't read that and not be reminded of what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. All scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. And so our any adequacy that we would hope to have as ministers of the new covenant is, a, is an adequacy that is solely received from God. And when we receive that ministry, we are thoroughly equipped 
to do uh, what it is that we are supposed to do here. He continues in verse 6, who also made us adequate as servants of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the, life, uh, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face fading as it was, how shall the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? And again, we'll talk more about that glorious uh, aspect of this here in just a moment. But we are ministers. Again, our effort, our ability, our... Uh, uh, in any hope of success that we could have is based entirely upon the fact that our strength, our ability, it comes from God. What does Philippians 4.13 say? I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. I, I have no strength apart from God. I have no ability uh, apart from God. I will never have any success as a minister if I don't fully understand that my success, my ability, totally lies in the function uh, and, and power of God. Let me share with you just a few more uh, uh, passages here. John chapter 15, when Jesus is speaking about that true vine, notice what he says here in verses 4 and 5. Let me get my pages turned here. <clears throat> He says here, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. If I expect to bear any kind of fruit in the ministry and, 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 and service that I'm involved in, uh, I need to make sure that that is entirely and 100% uh, tied to Jesus. He continues in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. Why is that? Because he continues apart from me. You can do nothing. Uh, there is uh, some other... Oh, these are, these are good. Uh, the, the psalmist writes in chapter 27, verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I dread? We've got nothing to be afraid of with God on our side. That's exactly what the psalmist Writes. Notice what he says in, in Psalm 28, beginning in verse 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart exalts, and with my song I shall thank Him. The Lord is their strength, and He is a saving defense to His anointed. Save Thy people and bless Thine inheritance. Uh, be their shepherd also and carry them forever. Yeah. God wants to be our help. He wants to be our shepherd. He wants to be our strength. And because He wants that for us, He's going to be sure to make that available to us. We just got to go there, right? You can't put gas in your car unless you get to the pump to put it in, right? Uh, our ministry, there's three things about it. <clears throat> you know, it, obviously it's spiritual, and, and, uh, but it is a new type. Uh, it is spiritual, and it is life giving. You know, when, <clears throat> when I say that it's, an, it's a new type, we have to remember to keep in context what's going on here. And in John chapter 9, verse 29, notice what the, uh, uh, the leaders of the Old Covenant, or the followers of the Old Covenant, they said here, we know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he's from. Now, we can understand I think we can understand what they're saying here because they have been following the Old Covenant for thousands of years. They've been following that teaching. They've been, they've been doing their best to adhere, uh, you know, to it. And so when Jesus comes along, because the, the majority, we have to keep this in mind, folks. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, although they are a part of the New Testament, the majority of the things that are written in those four books is still taking place in the Old Covenant. Okay? And so when these people say these things in John 9, 29, it, it's a transitional thing. They're, they're, they are witnessing the end of the Old Covenant and the establishment of the New. And so their question, it's not without uh, importance, right? 
But we also need to understand what Jesus earlier said in, in John, in chapter 5. He says here, uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, yes, chapter 5, in verses 45 through 47, Jesus says, Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? You know, and so when Paul is writing these things to the Corinthian brethren, there are people there who are still focused on following the Mosaic law, and Paul is trying to teach them no. You know, I've said this before, and I, th I think it's right to remind us of this because it, it, it's a very good question. What is the point of following a system of worship if that system does not ultimately lead you to heaven? Makes sense, doesn't it? I think, it's, I think it makes great sense. You know, <clears throat> there is a... There is, in, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17... In this passage here, I think that people look at it from an incorrect... Not everybody, but I think there are a lot of people that look at this from a wrong perspective. Because in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And so there are some who will, you know, they kind of focus on the first portion of that, you know, and, and, and so they think that don't, you know, when Jesus says, don't think I came to destroy the law, they're, they're thinking that we are supposed to still continue to follow uh, to whatever extent, we're supposed to still continue to follow the tenets of the old covenant. But is that what Jesus said here? That's not at all what he said. We, he didn't come to abolish them. He came to fulfill them. And I think that's... He was saying that in so many words in John chapter 5 at the end of that chapter there when he was telling them, if you would believe Moses, then you would believe me. Right? Um, <clears throat> look at uh, Galatians chapter 5. In, in, in Galatians... This was a group of people, too, that were trying to continue to follow the old covenant in various degrees. And, and Paul says in chapter 5, verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision as written in the Mosaic law, okay, that's what's implied here. If you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is then under obligation to keep the whole law. And so if you're going to follow this aspect, if you're going to do circumcision, you better make sure that you're continuing to do the sacrifices. You better make sure that you continue to follow the laws of the various holidays, holy days that were instituted. You know that the ten, of the Ten Commandments, only nine of them are repeated for us to follow in the New Testament? Only nine. There's one missing in the New Testament, and that's the fourth one. We're not supposed to follow the Sabbath laws, because if we follow the Sabbath laws, again, the same principle would apply. If you're going to follow the Sabbath laws, then you are under obligation to keep the whole law. And so we need to understand that. Look at Colossians chapter 2. In Colossians 2, uh, beginning in verse 16, he says here, <clears throat> Therefore let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. And so Paul literally says here, the Sabbath... Is, was only a shadow of what we now have. 
Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind. You know, when Paul says here, <clears throat> have you ever met with somebody who said they had a vision? I don't find anywhere in Scripture where we are to be confrontational to that individual and say, no, you didn't really have a vision or you misunderstood what you saw. That's not the way we're supposed to approach that. My, uh, I forget, and it's on my phone, my, my Bible app sent me today's uh, passage, and it is a gentle answer turns away, it's going to be in Proverbs, a gentle answer turns away wrath. Uh, but the opposite does the opposite. <laughs> that's, that's a paraphrase, okay? Um, but that's true. If someone says they have a vision, I, who am I to disagree with that? I have, no, I have absolutely no clue what goes... You know, the more that I study counseling and, and the psychology behind all that, I am absolutely amazed what goes on in our mind. What causes it to function right? The, the causes that cause it to function poorly, you know? But the point here is that Paul is trying to make to the Colossians, don't base your salvation upon a vision. That's what he's saying here. Let's continue. Taking a stand on vision, he's seen inflated without cause by his fleshly mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the entire body being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments, which grows with a growth which is from God. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which refer to things destined to perish with using in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have, to be sure, the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. In other words, the things that some would teach that, are, that in their minds are designed to make us more holy, uh, they in fact do not create such. They don't. And so Paul is saying that. Uh, we have a spiritual, uh, a spiritual uh, existence here, and, and we need to keep that in mind. For, you know, I reminded us, uh, I remind us of John 1, 17, the law came by Moses, grace and truth realized by Jesus, but in Ephesians chapter 2, to take that idea a little bit farther, he says here, beginning in verse 5, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus in order that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And that's the ministry that we have. It is a spiritual ministry and it's life-giving. You know, when you look at the passages that we read in, in uh, Corinthians chapter 3, they are, uh, there's a difference between a ministry of death and a ministry of life. If we continue to follow that which was taught by Moses, uh, albeit good for the time period that it was, if we continue to following that, it is not a life uh, uh, that God wants us to have. It is a ministry of death. And that's why his ministry, the ministry that we involve ourselves in, is much more glorious. Look at verses 9 through 11 of uh, Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> he says here, If the ministry of condemnation has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory on account of the glory that surpasses it. For if that which fades away was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. And so what we have is more glorious than the former. What, if I was to ask you, what, what do you find as, uh, as glorious? I mean, if you, what do you think of when, when you think of glory? You know, one of the thoughts that came to my mind in, in, 
initially responding to that it, fireworks. That's just pretty cool, you know, the bombs bursting in air kind of thing. Um, uh, Miss Howe, who wrote the battle hymn of the Pro uh, Republic, she offers a different idea of what is glory when, when she wrote, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. What she writes there is kind of scary, actually, because what here is she describing as glorious? It's the fact that God is going to judge the world. But what's glorious in that description is that although it's not going to be glory for those who don't follow God and have chosen to go their own way, it is exactly glorious for those who are going to have Christ as their advocate. When you stand before the Father on Judgment Day and, and God rightly points His accusatory finger at us because we have all sinned, yet for those who have been saved by the blood of Christ, we have Jesus our, as our advocate standing right there. And so when God points the finger, Jesus says, wait. He has accepted my sacrifice. She believes in what I've done. And God through Jesus, looks at each of us and says, enter into the glory of thy Father, good and faithful servant. Amen? That's glorious. That's, glor That's what he wants us. Because in the passages that Paul writes to the Corinthians here, there's two types of glory. There is the, that which uh, existed with Moses, and, there is, and, and it was so glorious that when Moses came down from the mountain, he had to put that veil over his face because the people could not bear looking at him. That's why he wore that veil. But it faded away, didn't it? Moses didn't have to wear that veil forever. It's gone. And the glory that we have now is that which supersedes the former. That leads us into the hope that we have in, in, first, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through uh, 16 here. It talks about a ministry of hope. And folks, this is, this is the entire goal of any service that we would offer to anybody uh, in the name of Christ, any, uh, any, any teaching that we do. And, and I have to tell you about Edith's Bible. Uh, this lady that I met last week, she... Uh, she's in the hospital and she, she's needing a Bible and she wanted a particular version. We didn't have one and uh, Nanny had one that uh, sadly because of her vision she can't read anymore and it's not the version that Edith wanted but it, it's, a good, it's a good version. It, it's, I will say it's the better than the one that she had but anyway when I took it to her and we were talking she picked that thing up and she put it in her arms like this. And her next words were, you know, I'm going to hold on to this forever. And, 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 and tell your, tell your mother-in-law, I'm very thankful that she gave me her Bible. I got a call from Aaron later on that night, and she told Aaron, you know, I'm going to be able to sleep tonight. It's... Uh, that's the hope that we are instilling in people's lives with the Word of God. Uh, you know, there's so, so much more that, that we need to talk about here, but I'm looking at the time, and, and really we could spend another 45 minutes. I will share with you these things, because one of the things that Paul says in, in his... Uh, in his closing remarks here in chapter 3 is that, <clears throat> of 2 Corinthians, is that this hope is in Christ. You know that? It's in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, were sealed with him, sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge 
with a view to the redemption that we will have. And, and how do we get in him? You know, Paul talks about that to the Galatians in chapter 3 when he says, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, you have clothed yourselves with Christ. What better way to be protected from everything that attacks us? Uh, but that's why he says the ministry we have is better. That's why the ministry we have is hopeful. That's why the ministry we have is glory filled. Amen? We got something good, don't we, people? You know, if you, if you have yet to experience salvation the way that Scripture teaches, come forward, won't you, so we can share with you a little bit more information, answer whatever questions and prayers you have. Uh, but whatever you need, come forward while we stand and sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of His Word, what a